was in the movie The Lone Ranger and I played the horse. All right, Shit Talks is finally back. It's been I don't know how long, but uh, Dexter's sick. He's not here to host, but instead I've got someone a hell of a lot more impressive. Uh, Tony Goldmark, say hello. Hello, everybody, all, all the <laughs> listeners, hello. Um, for those of you who don't know, you <laughs> should know Tony. Um, he's been making videos for goodness knows how many years on several different channels under the name Some Jerk with the Camera. Mainly around Disneyland and other mm -hmm. theme parks, right? Mainly, yes. Uh, uh, it's kind of a theme park centric show, but I also uh, I, uh, my my main uh, centerpiece show is called Some Jerk with a Camera, and that's a review show about various um, attractions and retrospectives of entire parks and full on reviews of uh, like like movies and TV shows based on theme parks, but also. Uh, I do a couple of sideshows, like, for example, State of the Parks, which is more of a news and reviews type show, or, uh, or a, a news and um, an editorial type show, and then one movie later where I vlog about uh, current movies in theaters. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and it's all under the YouTube channel uh, Tony Goldmark, which is named after me. All right, perfect. So, so um, I just want to talk a little bit about your, your start before... Um, well, first, uh, every episode we try to talk about some current event or another and comment on it briefly just as an icebreaker. So um, I felt like the most obvious one to talk about, and because um, we, need, we need a little bit of positive news in our lives, but... Because um, <laughs> the current events this week are just so fun for a fun podcast to talk about. <laughs> in many about. respects, you're completely Good right. It, it, <laughs> shit's shit's getting pretty Lord. abhorrent, I agree with yeah. you. <laughs> It, it's just it just gets worse and worse every every goddamn day. It's but but anyway. What, well, what, what I was going to discuss um, was the fact that um, Jennifer Lee and Pete Doctor are taking over as the CCO of Disney and Pixar, respectively, which I think is wonderful. Yes, they are. I I th I wholeheartedly support it. I um, I think it's a very good decision on both ends. Uh, Lassiter, uh, I, I respect creatively many of the decisions he made. I, I respect his creative leadership over, over Walt Disney feature animation and of Pixar. Um, I, I, but I also very much support his firing and make no mistake. It is most likely a firing. It's probably not him. I, you know, they're trying to play it as, Oh, he's just leaving at the end of the year. No, it's a, I mean, I mean, it's probably a golden parachute situation, but they, they can't have, you know, sexual harassers in power anymore. They're, they're Disney. They got to, you know, project the warm and sunny feelings and, and, you know, and so many, um, They've been remarkably good, uh, I, I think, at, at handling these kinds of controversies in the new era of just Twitter and social media just kind of dominating the conversation. It's like, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, controversy they've run into over the past year or so is the revelation that they underpay uh, employees at their theme parks, and then next thing you know, they announce, "Oh, we're increasing everyone's pay at the theme park." So they're very good at at that kind of PR. They're they're very good at all that. And uh, yeah, Lassiter absolutely had to go. Um, you know, uh, like I saw on another level, like like um, I was at D twenty three last year in Anaheim, and I saw him uh, give a speech about the about future theme park developments. And he was very visibly drunk. He was like slurring his words. He was just, I'm, I'm not kidding. Look for, look for video footage. He's like, we're going to, we're going to, we're, we're, we're going to put Pixar pier. We're going to have Pixar fest and we're going to turn everything into Pixar. It's all going to be fixed. It's like, Oh my God, is John Lasseter. Okay. And then, and then you learn, oh, he's been, you know, grabbing women's legs and shit like that. It's like, well, yeah, he's drunk out of his mind, dear God. And yeah, ap apparently he has a huge uh, alcohol problem now. And uh, 
you know, it's uh, it, it's fucked up, and it's 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 and it's sad because you know this is the fucking director of Toy Story and all that. But you know, I, I've always maintained like uh, he he's always been a big part of Pixar um, for the last uh, fifteen years or so. He's been a big part of feature animation. He alone is not Pixar. He alone is not Walt Disney feature animation. He's just a, he's just been a big part of it. And, um, you know, the, the man hasn't – I mean, let's be honest. The man – he hasn't directed a film since 2011. He hasn't directed a good film since 2006. <laughs> you are wrong. And he hasn't directed a great film – and he hasn't directed a great film since 1999. So, you know, it, it's, it's like these companies will continue to flourish without him. And his replacements, I think, are absolutely spot on. They're definitely who I would have picked. Uh, Pete Docter, um, appropriately, was also the first guy to ever direct uh, a movie that wasn't uh, for yeah, Pixar. That exactly. wasn't John Lasseter. And he did. He knocked it out of the park. Yeah, he 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 direct he directed Monsters Inc. and Up and uh, Inside Out. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 I get the feeling that Andrew Stanton was probably asked. I have no proof of this, but uh, Andrew Stanton's always seemed like kind of the closest thing Pixar's ever had John to a Carter number two guy. John Carter makes me think otherwise, though. Um, I don't know if they would have picked him after that. Well, <laughs> you know, the, there's there's things I like it's about John Carter. It's not a bad movie. It's I, I don't think it's successful. A, it's, 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 it's pretty good. It's it, it's not a complete disaster that, that its reputation would suggest. Um, I mean, it, it, I, definitely worth a rental, I would say. But, um, but yeah, Andrew Stanton probably said no, ju- just out of like, yeah, I, I I get the feeling from from just just everything I know about him that he's much more of a creative guy. Because that's that's the problem with taking a job like that is once you oversee everything, once you have to you know be kind of the creative executive. Um, you don't get to you don't get to actually do the creative work anymore. You you, you don't you you're kind of just you know spending your day looking at, looking at spreadsheets and shit and um, and you have a lot of creative influence over the company, but like like John Lasseter, um, you know, 2011 was the last time he actually directed a film and it sucked. So you know i don't um i don't blame anyone for not wanting that job even though i'm sure it pays very well and uh and and, uh pete doctor i think um pete doctor i think excellent choice jennifer lee another excellent choice not as much experience as as pete doctor had or even as john lassiter had um but i think still a good choice jennifer lee was the first um the first woman to ever uh, co-direct a feature for Walt Disney feature animation before frozen. Uh, that had never happened. In fact, uh, the, the short film that was released with frozen, get a horse was the first film was Disney's first uh, Disney animations, first theatrical film of any kind with only a woman director. And that was, uh, Lauren McMillan. And yeah, it took way too long. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, you know, Jennifer Lee was also um, she co-wrote the story of Frozen and was, I believe, the only credited screenplay writer. So if it if Frozen could have been said to have had one single directorial authorial voice, it is hers. And uh, and it was the biggest hit in um, in, in the history of uh, Walt Disney feature animation. So, of course, they're going to give her that job. Um, also wrote the recent uh, A Wrinkle in Time movie, but we won't hold that against her. So the uh, but um, for for whatever reason, she's not gonna get as much uh, misogynist, sexist flack as uh, as Kathleen Kennedy currently gets, just because Disney animated features don't have as many whiny, you know, broken fanboys as Star Wars does. So I'd like to hope so. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's it's the princess. The, the Disney princess brand has always made uh, Disney animation like really uh, a, a, a really popular brand for girls. Like I remember when I was a kid, it was it was kind of uncool to like Disney animated movies. Uh, you know, if if you were a boy, like 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 Aladdin was pretty good because it had like a male protagonist and all that. But um, but like you know, Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, it just it just wasn't considered cool. Even though we, you know, the boys saw those movies anyway because they were good. But 
but you know, it's it, but that's what happens is that when you have a fan base that primarily appeals to women, directly to women or girls, it tends to not have as much of a misogyny problem unless there's ponies involved for some reason. I don't know why, but, you know. It doesn't make sense to me either. No, I, I will never understand the, 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 the My Little Pony fan base. And, and you know what? It, it's fine. Let them have it. I just don't get it. Uh, I do want to go on to a little bit, just of a brief talk, uh, tangent on a similar topic. Um, all of your stuff is funny. I, I love your humor and how surreal it is. Oh, thanks. I didn't, I'm always about like humor that isn't the norm. So a lot of your jokes are, you know, I don't see them coming. And that's part of why they work so well. But uh, I have to say, one of the best things I've seen you do, just in general, would have to be just kill Bosby in general. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, kill Bosby. <laughs> um, I, I should probably explain for the listeners who aren't familiar. Um, kill Bosby was a character that I basically... I don't even want to say that I invented him, really, because there's not much... <laughs> to the character beyond just it being a really bad Cosby impression where I just say the most deranged, <laughs> fucked up shit imaginable. And not even and not even just like, you know, the kind of fucked up shit everyone likes to say with a Cosby. But, but you know, just stuff like, you know, I was in the move of the Lone Ranger and I played the horse. <laughs> and to prepare for this role, I went back in time and, and I was fight, fucking my face in the mud with Moses. And, you know, just bizarre, random ass, you know, nonsense shit like that. And, I, and you know, hey, remember when 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 Clint Eastwood and I, t uh, t we took turns, uh, we took turns tying each other's dicks in a knot, you know, shit like that. And just. But the um, and this was just something I would randomly do, like in Skype call, in Skype calls with my friends, and uh, and eventually, uh, after I finished the first season of Some Jerk with a Camera, like my TiVo had accidentally recorded part of this PBS documentary, which it which for some reason had an interview with Cosby in it, but it was like Cosby in current day 2011, and um. And the uh, and and he was just you know ranting about you know working on Fat Albert or something. And I took this footage and I basically and I I inverted the color scheme so that his skin looked blue. And I just and I just played footage of it while just ranting about random ass topics. And and the the conceit was that he was hosting the outtake special, kind of like. You know, one of those old Dick Clark, Ed McMahon, like, you know, oh, here's a bunch of bloopers. But he wasn't – it couldn't have had less to do with the actual bloopers he was just talking about. Like, you know, yeah, I ever tell you about when I was once gang raped by the Rugrats? You know, it's just, it's just, just dumbass shit like that. And, um, and then uh, uh, again uh, at the end of season two of Some Jerk with a Camera, um, I did another um, – outtake special with kill bosby where i used a bunch of other uh, a bunch of various clips but mostly from his then most recent stand-up special far from finished and that was 2014 and then it suddenly didn't become so funny to do cosby voices anymore and uh i, I still worked him into the third season of some jerk in my shrek 4d episode because yeah, that, that, episode, that's, that shocked me a yeah, little bit <laughs> Now the those first two outtake specials actually aren't avail available on YouTube uh, right now. I uh, well b b well I'll get to that. But anyway, in in my Shrek 4D review, um, part of the plot of Shrek 4D is that F Lord Farquaad is back, but he's a ghost now, and it's completely stupid because there were there were no ghost in ghosts in the Shrek movies. They're just inventing this now. So they can have an evil, so they can have a villain without having to render a whole new I own character. The DVD, it's painful. Basically. Yeah, it's 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 really bad. But um, and so in the review, I came up with the conceit that I was being haunted by a bunch of ghosts. And of course, if you're if you're doing ghosts, one of them has to be Ghost Dad, played by Kill Posby. And 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 I even acknowledge the awkwardness, like in that episode. I'm like, uh, the Cosby impressions are no longer funny. Well, that is a fiction of the literal media. They are always blaming me for the actions of my evil twin. And so so that episode, um, 
has been around for a while. And then season three finally came to a close. And I was faced with a real dilemma. But I thought of I don't want to spoil it. I don't want I am still working on the season three outtake special. And I'm going to I'm going to re-upload the other two, uh, um, the season one and two outtake specials when that's close to being done. The problem is I keep having to put it off to work on all these other videos. But um, but I, I, I'm not going to say exactly what I have planned for the season three outtakes, but it's going to I'll, I'll just put it this way. It's possibly the most complex video i've ever done <laughs> and and that and that's saying something so uh so look for that uh when i finally get it done in like five years is it, or so is it more complex know. than that previously on acid joke from your epcot retrospective uh yes because it because that was just one little you know 10 second thing and uh, and this is gonna be all over the place that that previously on acid joke by the way it was like I had just upgraded from, you know, using fucking Windows oh Movie Maker to I, I'd, I'd finally bit the bullet and downloaded Adobe Premiere from like 2012. So, so it's still not that much of a leap, but, you know, still it's like, OK, this is a real editing software. And I was just I, I, that was just me going, OK, let's see what this baby can do. And, and just every fucking effect thrown at the wall at once to just create this cacophony of nothing for like 10 seconds. And yeah, that was fun. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, have you lived in California all your life? Uh, I, I grew up in San Francisco. And then when I was 18, I moved to Chicago and I went to uh, Columbia College, Chicago, uh, lived there for about six years, and then in 2008, uh, I moved to L.A., and I've been living here ever since uh, in the same apartment, in fact. In fact, this month is the 10th anniversary of me moving into this crappy little apartment in, in Koreatown. It's a start. It's never too late. <laughs> yeah. You know. uh, so how the hell did you get to the whole Country Bears thing? Had you watched that before 2008? Well, well, I didn't start my show until uh, 2011, yeah. and I, I just had this idea. Like, I was a big fan of, uh, of of all the shows on that on what was then called That Guy with the Glasses yeah. dot com. You know, the Nostalgia Critic and the Nostalgia Chick and Brad Jones and Linkara and all that people and uh, all those people. And I thought, well, that, that looks like a fun thing that I. L that I could be doing, you know, I, I'd kind of moved to LA to try to break into TV writing and that wasn't really happening for me. So I, uh, but I, you know, saw all these people doing all these DIY shows on the internet and I thought, well, I could do that. You know, I, I don't, you know, I, I, it'd be nice for me to have more like a direct line to a potential audience than to have to go through a bunch of producers and shit and, and, and have to deal with, you know, network sensors and things like that. And, and I realized no one was doing theme parks. You know, there were people doing movies and video games and comic books and music and all that stuff. But I was really into theme parks. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I'm a big movie and, and music fan myself. But it was like, well, no one's no one's doing Disneyland. Of course, nowadays it feels like everybody's doing it. Like, like there's there's all these channels about, you know, the history of various rides and all that. And they all have ten times as many subscribers as me. But it feels like they're all kind of the same they're all kind of just a disembodied narrator doing kind of this dry video essay just going over historical facts and you know there's no pizzazz to like it that's a like, lot like of I, videos now there's a lot of just dry you're totally right you don't see the face a lot of the time yeah and, and you don't necessarily have to i mean there's various ways of doing it as long as you can make it interesting but i just find that so many of these videos kind of aren't and and i and, and, and you know i mean Obviously, I don't. I, there's a reason I'm not on Channel Awesome anymore, and we don't have to talk about that unless you want to. But I'd be happy the, um, to hear, but that's that's but your choice. Well, 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 I can talk about it later. But right, right now, let's yeah. stay on topic. But the, um, but you know, I I always admired just how the nostalgia critic did his show, where he he you know he would weave in sketches and and various jokes in there. And I never thought even he was taking it far enough, but I could see the potential of doing something in the Nostalgia Critic format. And I was like, well, if I'm doing a show on theme parks, I can shoot it on location at those theme parks. And I don't have to, you know, just shoot in front of a boring white wall all the time. Exactly. And um, 
And the whole idea came about, and I thought, well, people love, you know, reviews of bad movies, and Disney's released some of the worst ever, and The Country Bears was the first ever movie based on a Disney theme park attraction, so that seemed that just seemed like a good place to start, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, uh, so we talked a little bit earlier about some of these really surreal ideas. Did you have, like, an inspiration? Like, were there a lot of people that you studied a lot as a kid in terms of comedy like where are you getting these ideas from (laughs) well i've always been a fan of kind of absurdist um non sequitur comedy always a huge fan of like you know i i mean when i was a really little kid i guess it all started with like looney tunes and mad magazine and stuff like that um as a as a teenager i got super into weird al yankovic and I'm still really super into him to this day, almost to an obsessional level. And, um, and, and, and you know, just stuff like uh, – one of my biggest comedic inspirations actually was a, was a show that was on MTV2 very briefly, only for a couple of short seasons in the mid-2000s called Wonder Chosen, which was like a parody of Sesame Street, but everything was on crack, basically. And, and so it, it just had the most – and it just had the most bizarre non sequiturs everywhere. Have you seen that gif that's really popular of this black kid yelling, "That's racist!" I don't think I've actually seen that. That comes. That oh that well well it's a gif that I've seen a bunch of times, but it comes from Wonder Shows, and that that's the source of that. But you you know like they'd have real little kids on screen saying just the most fucked up shit. Like like they'd have this really cute little kid, you know, the, the, this cute little brace face kid, you know, just couldn't be more than seven or eight, just saying, "Hey mom, hey dad, look, I made it. I'm on TV. How's prison?" <laughs> you know, just. Just fucked up These shit like children, that. We and, need a um, ten years later reunion. Yeah, you, we really do. But and it would just, or or, or it would, or you know, this the this little kid would um, would would go around you know um, the streets of New York dressed as Hitler, asking people what's wrong with the youth of today. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. It just. And, and anyway, I I loved that show so much, and I've, and I and I was a huge fan of uh, Adult Swim in the early days as well. That that's a that's another big source of kind of my absurdist, um, just just kind of random ass Did you uh, ever comedy. Watch Swami Jeff? And I don't believe so. That does not ring a bell. I it it, it, it well, what was Swami Bell? What was uh, I'm not Swami even Jeff? Because sure, I have I have a couple of really old tapes that were court recordings of tv broadcasts and i've got one from 2008 i think it is and it's like really late night adult swim because like my dad wanted to record mm. uh, the beavis and butthead movie and just kept it going and i think at like three in the morning or something mm. they played this show called swami jeff and like do you remember mr meaty on nickelodeon with like those really fucking ugly puppets yes i i I do remember Mr. Meaty. wasn't a big fan of it, but I remember it. Well, it was existing. the same kind of art style as Mr. Meaty, but there was only like one guy, right. and he was like, he was like this Zen monk kind of dude who would just sort of like levitate and like meditate and shit and like act all chill. And it's like the weirdest fucking shit. I didn't understand it at all when I watched it. Yeah, I mean, I, I well, I, I love it whenever you can combine weirdness with actual wit. Like, like there have been sh- so many shows, especially uh, uh, Adult Swim does this a lot, where a show will just be kind of weird for the sake of weird, and it's not funny anymore. But, um, but you know, if you can actually make a joke out of it or, or make some sort of, you know, comedic or satiric point, like, like Too Many Cooks might be the best thing Adult Swim's ever done. Like, like that's – that kind of stuff is really uh, uh, in large part where that brand of my humor comes from. What – one of the other things I did, one, uh, another video that I made, well, actually one of my favorite videos was I took an, an episode that I had done on uh, Halloween time at Disney where I talked about all the, um, like, you know, the retheming various yeah, attractions to Halloween and, and space, Ma- uh, you know, turning Space Mountain into uh, into Ghost Galaxy and Haunted Mansion Holiday and all that stuff. And um, But I took that existing video and I recorded what I call a bizarro commentary from hell, where I where I I took away all the audio and just every shot of the review was replaced with different audio 
that just made it just crazy and stupid and and wacky. And I, I got off like like that was all you know sleep deprived craziness. And I had no plan for any of it. Like like I just I started at the beginning and it was it was like you know the editing equivalent of improv in a way where I was just you know okay what am I gonna do for this shot uh, here what am I gonna do for this shot uh, here you, you know and I just had no. I, I had no thought process going into it. It was just sheer, you know, arbitrary choices and, and shit. And and it was – it got pretty weird, but you, you can see that on my YouTube channel, my Bizarro Commentary from Hell. Yeah, no, I, I think I might have seen that before. All of your yeah, insanity it's, it's, starts to it's, blend it's, after a while. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so you've been on a number of different networks. Like I think I found you on Mr. Coat because I used to watch the hell out of that site. Ah, Mr. Coat. Yeah, I, I believe I'm still on Mr. Coat, if I'm not I mistaken. I haven't visited the site in a while, but I assume so. So how did that happen? He just uh, contacted me and, and said, hey, can I host your videos? And I was like, yeah, I, I just figured, you know, uh, the more places where my videos were hosted, the better. No, that makes so. sense. It's a shame because not enough people know uh, the Coat man himself. You know. Yeah, aggregate sites are kind of dead now. It's, it, it's like everyone's everyone just goes directly to YouTube. I, I mean, in the days when Blip existed, oh, I miss Blip. Um, I, mean, I didn't always miss the way they treated us, but I miss, but I miss, I kind of miss the alternative to YouTube being there. Um, but you know, it, it was like that guy with the glasses dot com was really essential because it was like, oh, here's all your favorite Blip shows just in the same place, and. Um, and now, you know, everyone's just on YouTube. Everyone just – everyone – and, and you know, YouTube's algorithm, you know, is not perfect, but it, you know, detects, oh, you watch this video. You might want to watch this video on, on, a, on the same topic. And um, and it's just there's kind of no need for aggregate sites anymore. So – in fact, did you hear about um, – there was an attempt last year – to start an aggregate site on Disney blogs called Disflex. I have not heard of this. And it was – okay, it was such a fiat – well, like when I first heard about it, I first heard like a lot of people on you know the Disney Twitter uh, – various Disney Twitter accounts kind of talking about what a fiasco it is. And I looked into it and they have like this – video you know describing what disflix is and it's basically it's like an aggregate site but for people who talk about disney world and i was like all right this doesn't sound like you know i've heard worse ideas i if they asked me i might even consider joining but then they they drop the bombshell it's all behind a paywall nobody's gonna watch that they were <laughs> exactly nobody's gonna fucking pay 9.99 a month just to watch a bunch of jackasses just talk about fucking going to Disney World. First of all, I'm pretty sure that's that's a direct copyright violation to talk, you know to to charge other people to to fucking um to to, to talk uh, to watch you talk about to talk about a Disney park. And second off, Netflix only charges 7.99 a month. So you're all, you're up charging people from from watching actual content and you think you're you're worth that much it's like no the the most you can get away with is like you know a voluntary patreon so you know uh, not a not a bad idea just a horrible way to unveil yeah, it i know you're not wrong uh so i i did notice especially when you finally did get on channel awesome to go back to that topic you were you were mm -hmm. doing a lot of work with doug and i mean it was just him at a table and you at a park but he showed up a lot right so how did that sort of collaboration happen? Well, I just always wanted um, – I was a huge fan of his, and I wanted to get him involved with my show. I figure, okay, I've, I've been accepted on the Channel Awesome. I should use this. I should try to – you know, I, I should try to get Doug Walker uh, involved in my show because I knew he would sometimes shoot cameos uh, for people. And you know, and so he's in a few episodes of mine. He's in my uh, Back to the Future: The Ride review. He's in my. Um, I know eventually I actually visited Chicago and I shot a cameo for my Harry Potter um, uh, video, and I, and he's also in my uh, uh, Haunted Mansion yeah. movie review because he had also done 
He had also done a review of the Haunted Mansion movie, and I wanted to acknowledge that right off the bat before leap, uh, before leaping into mine. And um, and then last year, uh, he invited me to um, co-review the Sorcerer's Apprentice with him, for uh, the the 2010 Sorcerer's Apprentice movie with Nicolas Cage. Uh, for his show, and that, you know, th that was a pretty good experience at the time, uh, and that video got more views than everything else I released on my channel that year combined, so, you know, um, it's it's really a shame that, that Channel Awesome um, has kind of, I, I, I mean, I guess we could talk about Change the Channel, uh, I just, I just think it's a shitty situation, and I... I told them, like, right off the bat, right when all this shit was just starting, you know, just apologize. Just write an apology letter. That's all anyone's asking for. That You know, just, just say, we, we fucked up. We treated some people badly. Um, we're better now. Because they are better now. M maybe don't phrase it that way. Maybe phrase it like we will try to be better going forward. Because they already were, in my view. Like, like, like my experience working with them was a complete 180 from all the horror stories I'd been reading. And, you know, I, I feel like these people did learn from their experiences and genuinely improve, but they just, they, they wouldn't really show people. They, they, they wouldn't show people by swallowing their pride and just fucking apologizing. And I don't understand. I just fundamentally don't understand how some people are like that. Where do you think the rumor so. came from that Doug and Rob were leaving? Because there was a huge uproar about it, and then nothing happened. Wishful thinking, maybe. I, I mean, may, may, I I have no idea. I, um, you know, I, I I'd heard that um, Doug, someone at a con asked Doug about it, and he replied like, "I can't talk about it right now," which led everyone to believe, "Oh, he's, you know, the, our our lawyers getting involved. Is Doug gonna try to?" you know, take back the, the nostalgia critic branding for himself, but that was all speculation, you know? So yeah, it's, it's a shitty situation. It didn't have to happen the way it happened. And, uh, and really I, I was just, the reason I left was I was just kind of disgusted by how they handled it. And it didn't have to be like that. It, it doesn't make sense. I, I agree with you. I was a big fan of channel awesome for years. And then I kind of grew tired of them. And then this happened and it, it is really odd, especially with some of the really dark stuff, which we don't need to get into, but it's quite a rabbit hole. But you are right. Not, not a lot of it is recent. Right. There, very little of it is recent. And, and, the stu and honestly, a lot of the stuff in that document is stuff that I don't even think is that big a deal. You know, stuff like, oh, well... He he wrote this thing for me in one of the anniversary movies, and and I didn't like it. But it's it, it's like, it's like, dude, it it's his movie at the end of the day. Like like he he's the director. They're uploading it on their channel. Ultimately, he should have creative control. If there's anything you're very uncomfortable with, you know, bring that up to him and and ask if he'll change it. But ultimately, the decision is his. So, I don't know. I I feel like. That still doesn't mean they they shouldn't have apologized though, because they they really should. Have. I, I think I'd say that's basic PR. How they didn't do that? It really is, and I and I sent them multiple emails uh, saying so, even b before this shit was even a big deal, when it was just starting to brew into what looked like might be something. I just said, look, I really I really think you guys need to respond to this, and they never got back to me. They they treated me like I was a total non-entity and it's like you know that's the problem with, with stuff like channel awesome is they try to straddle the line between it being a job and them just being friends but it's kind of the worst of both worlds because if if it's a job fucking pay us and if we're friends fucking respond to us you know it's just it, it, yeah so I, I left for a reason and then larry just never left i wonder if his stuff is still on there yeah, he's just he's just trolling everyone. He's he's literally he. I, I think he said um, he's trying to win the Channel Awesome Hunger Games or something. I've been meaning to talk to him about that. It's, it's insanity. Yeah. Um, what do you think is the best decision that Disney parks have made? Uh, yeah. Ever, <laughs> or or recently? Oh man. Um. Um. 
I guess, to exist in the first place. That was a huge gamble. Really, because it really was at the time. People don't realize that now, but... um, just the idea of 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 making a theme park that would actually be clean and wouldn't just be like a generic amusement park, um, you know, like like another Coney Island also ran. That in itself was very revolutionary. And like like there's this famous story of um, of one of of some of Walt's underlings uh, going to this amusement park owners convention somewhere in New Jersey or something and bringing the plans for Disneyland. And they were laughed out of the room. They say, you know, you can't do that. You can't have just one entrance. You can't have all these plants. People are just going to step on them. You can't do this. You can't do that. You know, can't keep you can't keep an amusement park clean. And they went back to Walt and and told them all this. And Walt said, good. If they liked it, I would have been worried. So that's um, and that's that's Disneyland for you. (laughs) Strange man. Uh, what do you think is the worst thing they've pulled off? Hmm. The wor- well, um, the general, ass- I, I mean, there, there's kind of specific, um, sub bullet points within this, but just the general aesthetic and idea of DCA 1.0, uh, DCA as it first opened in 2001, and for a multitude of reasons, just that, you know, the the guy who was in charge, uh, Paul Pressler, was, you know, he came from, you know, the, the gift shops and, and eateries division of, of Disney. He was not, you know, an attractions guy. And you can tell from the way that park, you know, was 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 done because it had very few really good attractions. And, uh, you know, even even most of the good ones were pretty cheap. And um and really, the the but the worst thing at that park um, when it first existed was Superstar Limo. Just everything about Superstar Limo is just the I think the worst thing Disney's ever done. It was loud. It was obnoxious. It was you know it, it was focused too much on it was focused too much on celebrity and not even big celebrities like not even not even impressive celebrities like oh wow they got that guy no just. You know, people like fucking Melanie Griffith and Drew Carey, you know, people no one even gives a shit about anymore. But um, it's, you know, it's just that's what happens when everything is about the bottom line and everything is just about, you know, how do we keep this under budget and how do we please our stockholders as opposed to how do we create something really impressive? Like, that's what I appreciate about um about how the parks are currently run is that they there really seems to be a lot of um, of emphasis on let's really wow people let you, you know just the designs I've seen for um, for Star Wars Galaxy's Edge which is opening next year like that's that's gonna be amazing that's gonna be that's gonna be incredible and um, the inc- and even when they're doing something cheap like a like a ride refurb, it feels like it's always too genuinely plus that ride. Like, like I think Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout, it's I, – I, I, I liked the DCA version of Tower of Terror. I think Mission Breakout is better. And, um, and the Incredicoaster looks like, um, looks like a lot of fun, although, you know, California Screaming was already a lot of fun, so maybe – maybe it doesn't have to work as hard. Um, but yeah, DCA 1.0 – just just sucked basically <laughs> and i and i do a whole I, one of my first videos the the second video i made in fact after uh after my country bears review was just about how much uh dca 1.0 sucked it was it, it was kind of a 10 year retrospective of the history of uh, of dca and um yeah it was it, it was never a worthy um companion piece to disneyland which is still possibly the best theme park ever built yeah i haven't really thought about it because i went i've been to disneyland twice one was in 2010 right before you had that video and dca mm. you know even as like a kid was pretty disappointing all things considered this was like right before they did the world of color and everything and then i went mm. yeah well well it was just kind of starting to revive itself like 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 toy story mania was opened by that point and that was kind of the first big like okay this park is starting to move in the right direction um but yeah if you went before world of color even opened then yeah it, it was just at the infancy of that i i there 
I remember there being a lot of work walls back then. Just, um, you know, because they were building the Little Mermaid ride and the and Cars Land and just and they, now did, did they when you went in 2010, did they still have the old uh, entrance or was that under construction? Did you have to go like around Soren to get into? The I park? honestly don't remember at all, but I do remember okay. like the, the plaza and stuff felt completely new to me. I remember there being like a really big train for some reason when you got into the park. I could be wrong on that. Right. Okay. That that was the old entrance. Then that was the old entrance that that had. Um, that, it, did it have the Golden Gate Bridge still? I'm not sure. I just remember a train. Okay. Well, yeah. Th- there was a train in the big central um, plaza. If, if you still remember the train there, then yeah, this was the old entrance. Oh well, yeah, I went back last year. But but it wasn't even but it wasn't even really a train. It was just an an eatery that was designed to look like a train. So yeah, no, it's weird because I went back last year. Totally different experiences. Yeah, absolutely. They they redesigned the the entrance area completely and just made it, you know, because the because the original entrance area was just kind of the ultimate embodiment of who cares. It was it, it, it honestly it was like the entrance to like a Six Flags park in, more than anything. It was like well like the big conceit of it was that it was meant to look like a postcard. But only from a certain angle, you know, and if you weren't standing at that exact angle where it looked like a postcard, it just looked like a bunch of random, you know, uh, just nothing. It, it didn't it it, it it didn't look interesting. It, it didn't look um, it, it, it didn't look good. It, it, it there wasn't a lot to it. And then you walked into the central area and it was just this kind of circular plaza and it had a fountain, and that was about it. And it, it just wasn't that interesting. You had to go to the actual parts of the park to see anything even slightly more interesting. But then in 2012, like, they shut down that whole entrance area. Um, it, I guess they started in late 2010, and, and, it, and it stretched all the way to summer of 2012. And then in the summer of 2012, they reopened it as their new entrance, Buena Vista Street, which is a complete night and day. It, it's basically like almost a mirror of Main Street, in a sense. The idea is, okay, Main Street was where Walt Disney... It it represents the small town in Missouri where Walt Disney grew up. Buena Vista Street will represent him arriving in California and seeing, you know, the Los Angeles of 1923. And it was... uh, And it it looks... And it's great. You know, it's it's like... It looks like another Main Street, basically, but even more interestingly designed. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, You've been expanding a lot into, you know, you've done a lot of Universal stuff. Uh, You've Mm -hmm. done Harry Potter recently. I'm not sure. I don't think that's part of Universal, but do you ever think you're going to run out of these sort of... Yeah, it is. No, no, uh, Harry Potter is uh, is in Universal Hollywood and Florida and Japan. Oh, damn. I haven't been to Universal in about eight yeah. years, so I have no clue what's going on. I actually oh, okay. went. The only time I've ever been to Universal was the day that Backdraft closed down. So I was one of the last people oh, to go man. into Backdraft, which was really interesting. Wow. That's – yeah, that would have been um, 2010? Yeah, 2010. That was, so was that – was this your was this your same trip as, yeah, as Disneyland? Okay. Yeah. All right. That checks uh, out. <laughs> yeah, but do you ever think you're going to run out? of material to review in terms of theme parks? I do sometimes <laughs> worry about that, but um, but I, I guess that's why my episodes take so long to make and why I try to pour everything that I have into every episode, you know, and, and try to make them as jam-packed as I possibly can just so, you know, okay, I, I don't, you know, a, a, at least I'm covering this to the fullest extent I can and and I'm taking my sweet time releasing it, and um, and so that, it, you know, to try to kind of stave off the day when I finally run out of everything. And I'm not even close to running out of everything, um, by the way. So and, and you know, if I ever do, I'll just uh, I'll I'll switch to something else, and um, and we'll, you know, the reason I called my show "Some Jerk with a Camera" was so you know instead of being branded as the theme park guy. I could just say, okay, well, I'm some jerk with a camera. As long as we've still got the camera and the jerk, I will be able to take this show in any direction I, I ever need to. So, Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really great. Uh, I, I have just one more question for you. 
What is your weirdest occurrence that has happened when trying to make one of these projects? What is just the most batshit crazy thing that's happened to you? <laughs> batshit crazy. Um, I don't know if it's um, batshit crazy, but um, I will need to think about that. Uh, I it's 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 a little um, put me on the spot here. I. I remember one time uh, I got yelled at by um, – and, and you can actually see this in the I outtake I special. That. I was – yeah, I, I was yelled at by another uh, guest for for doing a bit where I said the word orgy. And, and I didn't even – I didn't even say it in any proper context. I, I didn't – like the joke wasn't explaining. It was more that I was just saying the word orgy and he was yelling at me for saying it when his kids were there. And – and it's like, okay, I'm not – I don't think – I wasn't even like talking at full volume. I was kind of just – I was doing that thing that I do a lot where if, if, it, if it needs to look like I'm talking loudly, I'll just – you know, I'll say it like this and I'll enunciate real – I'll enunciate and I'll gesticulate a lot, but I won't actually raise my volume that much. And then in post, I can add me yelling and I can you know make it look like I'm yelling in the park so I'm not disturbing anyone. But I guess I'd let that go a little out of control, and um, and and I and I also did a few too many takes. If I'm being completely honest, like like I always do that. I always get really self conscious, and I just do it over and over and over again, just to make absolute sure I've got enough for one solid take. And uh, and I guess it was just too much for this guy, so he, you know. He yelled at me for saying orgy in front of his kid. But, you know, I wasn't drawing that much attention to myself, I don't think. And and he, he I think, made it worse for his kid because it's like, OK, well, now, you know, he's your kid's going to ask what the hell is so bad about the word orgy and you're going to have to explain it to him, you dumb hick. So, you know, you, you just can't win with some people. And then there was the time. Um, uh, uh, one question a lot of people have asked is, have you ever gotten in trouble with Disney security? And the answer is usually no, because especially now, I think they've just come to expect that a lot of vloggers are going to be shooting at the park, you know, on location. Cause that's just kind of part of the entertainment sphere now. And, and they, I, I think they've learned, they just have to kind of live with it. Cause if they started really clamping down on it, then people would, uh, then, then I think there'd be some sort of protest. It, it just doesn't seem Disney to, to, to go after, you know, harmless little vloggers like me. So they just kind of leave us alone. But I do remember one time I was shooting uh, the co-review with Kyle Calgren on uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, specifically the 1946 Beauty and the Beast uh, directed by Jean Cocteau. And it was this big elaborate uh, musical review because we did parodies of all the songs from Disney's Beauty and the Beast and we shot it mostly on location at Disneyland. And... Um, and Kyle – and it was for Kyle's show, so he was in charge of you know getting the camera and everything. And he had brought his usual camera, which was like this big professional-grade camera that you know cost like thousands of bucks. And it came in its own like little backpack with like orange lining on the inside. And it, it looked every inch like a piece of professional equipment. It did not just look like, you know, a bunch of random goofballs, you know, vlogging with their phones at the, at the park or whatever. And, and so it attracted attention. And finally, at the, at, towards the end of our filming day, of our first filming day, we were told uh, not to shoot with that camera anymore and that if they caught us shooting again, they would ask us to leave entirely and just rewrote it into something totally different and um and uh and we and from that day we we just uh went about the rest of the trip we shot um with our tiny little cameras like with my flip cam that i still had and and i think uh our friends charlie and Haley brought their camera and we shot a bit with that and uh and park security never bothered us again so you know, that's the key to getting away with this shit. Just look like an amateur. You don't have to be an amateur. Just look like one. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, you can watch all these shows I've been talking about at YouTube.com slash Tony Goldmark. Uh, I also have a Patreon. If you feel like um, donating a couple of shekels here and there, that's Patreon.com slash Tony Goldmark. 
Uh, I've got an album that came out four years ago, but it's still available at tony-goldmark.bandcamp.com. That album is called Goldmark After Dark. And also at that site, you can download all the songs uh, from that Kyle Calgren co-review I was mentioning. And uh, I'm also on Twitter, and you can follow me there, at Tony Goldmark. Thank you so much for coming in and talking to me, Tony. Th thank you for having me.